Thank you very much. My name is James Crabtree of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy here in Singapore. We're here to talk about Asia's geopolitical chessboard, avoiding checkmate. And so what will follow is going to be a rapid fire canter through a number of the hot button issues that are worrying many of you, uh, I'm sure, uh, in an era in which geopolitics is increasingly impinging on economics, trade, and business in a way that um, we haven't been used to for the last two or three decades. So on my panel, uh, we have arrayed uh, a, a glittering list of experts. The far end, Kurt Tong, most recently uh, U.S. Ambassador in Hong Kong and Macau, now with the Asia Group in Washington. Uh, Ambassador Jim Stavridis uh, from the Carlisle Group, uh, but a longtime uh, decorated uh, naval uh, figure in the Pacific in particular, and also recently uh, the Dean of the Fletcher School uh, of Diplomacy at Tufts University. Uh, John Park uh, from the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, uh, an expert on uh, the Korean Peninsula, and so we'll be talking about North and South Korea. Farah Pandit, um, who's with the Council on Foreign Relations and also the Kennedy School, um, uh, who is an expert on countering violent extremism, and then Singapore's own Parag Khanna, who's an expert on pretty much everything. Uh, and so uh, uh, we'll, we'll let him wave, hold, 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 hold forth on, on all topics. So we're going to run this as a Q&A session. They've all gracefully agreed to leave their slides at home. So we're, we're going to do rapid fire Q&A, and then hopefully we'll have 10 minutes at the end to uh, turn to the audience. So, Let's start with you, Kurt, if you, if you don't mind. Can you tell us, so you have been a Korea diplomat um, most recently in Hong Kong. You've now gone over to the private sector, but you have a lot of experience looking at US foreign policy. Can you sketch out for us briefly to begin how you think US foreign policy is changing in Asia and the effect that that's having on the region? Sure. The, um, I think that, that uh, as people look at US foreign policy over the last couple, three years, uh, they focus on both the, the changes in operating style, uh, substance, and underlying philosophy. Um, and there has been, there's some very distinct aspects about the Trump administration, to put it mildly, in terms of the way that the president conducts foreign policy and some of his uh, uh, attitudes towards multilateralism, towards cooperation with allies, as opposed to uh, his predecessors. But the, the underlying, what I want to point out is that there's been one significant change uh, in U.S. foreign policy approaches to this region, which is not uh, time constrained or, or specific to the president. And that is the, the rather broad based and deep consensus within Washington policy making community that, that, that China is, as is frequently referred uh, in discussion, a strategic competitor of the United States. That's a, that's a pretty firm conclusion, which I don't think is going to change uh, anytime soon. It's based upon uh, the last couple decades of analysis and observation of trends in China and also in re the regional dynamics. The last thing I'll say, because I know you want to go quickly, is that the, having established that point of view, the, the U.S. Admin, this administration and perhaps subsequent ones are struggling to how to implement policies based upon that understanding of, of China as a challenge to um, a U.S.-led uh, regional order or, or a global order. Uh, and there are lots and lots of issues with China, ranging from everything from the environment to military balance, trade, cybersecurity, you name it. Everything every foreign policy issue that matters, China is a player, as is the United States, because we're such large and important places. But figuring out which issues the relationship should be fundamentally framed as cooperation, which ones framed as confrontation, and which ones framed as negotiation is a work in progress. And I think that that, that confusion about what to do about the fact that China is seen as a, as, as a preeminent uh, uh, country to work with on everything and, and, and which way to pursue the relationships is, is, uh, is going to be confusing for some time and, and, and uh, needs a lot of advice from, from everybody about how to do that. Okay. Jim, can I turn to you next? I, I mean, leading on from that and thinking partially about U.S.-China but also more broadly about the region, could you 
sort of sketch out how you see the changing military balance in the region. Underpinning the, the geopolitical flashpoints we're going to talk about is a sense of the military heft that different countries can bring to bear. So can you sketch that out for us to begin? I can. Um, so if you think about the potential for military conflict as requiring two elements, one is capability, military capability, and the other is motive. So very quickly, let's look at capability. The Pacific is by far the most militarized region of the globe. 75% of all defense spending occurs in the nations around the Pacific Rim. Just to do the numbers, um, 600 billion US, China about 225 billion, call it about 100 billion additive between Australia, South Korea, Japan. Uh, probably another 100 billion in there mix of other nations, including Singapore, which has very capable armed forces. Um, Russia, which is a Pacific nation, we ought to kind of remember that, about 80 billion, maybe 100 billion. So all told, globally, there is 1.5 trillion in defense spending, 1.1 billion is in the Pacific. So plenty of capacity. In terms of motive, well, let's start with the fact that several of the nations are actually still in a technical state of war, including Japan and Russia. I don't think they're going to go to blows anytime soon. But of course, the Korean Peninsula is still technically in a state of war. There are territorial disputes throughout, most notably the South China Sea, but also the northern territories of Japan, the Senkaku Daiyu Islands in the East China Sea. Um, and all the things the ambassador just mentioned um, kind of are part of, that part of that fabric to include cyber. There's already a kind of a shadow cyber uh, going a little beyond competition and into kind of a shadow war in the cyber world. So again, capacity over here and motive over here, those are two streams. And it's kind of like in Ghostbusters, you don't want the streams to cross. <laughs> so I think we've all got work to do. And it's really not just US, China. There is, as the ambassador said, a, a, a very rich, unfortunate, combustible mix in all of this that will require diplomacy, economics, culture, understanding of history, and a lot of different things if we're to avoid those streams crossing. Very good. Well, we're going to come back to US, China, and uh, cyber in a minute. Let me jump over to Parag here. So you're, as well as being an expert on everything, you are the author of The, the Future is Asian, an excellent book that you should all buy. And, and so in there, you argue that we're all really too obsessed about China, and particularly US, China. So sort of sketch out the broader regional context for some of these flashpoints right. for us. Great question. I think it's a great segue from what the Admiral has just said, because there is this tendency to in, engage in this kind of reductionism where the future of world order and everything in the Asia Pacific hinges really just on the US China dynamic. But as the Admiral pointed out, there is a significant distribution of investments in military capacity. And if you look at the economic landscape as well, it isn't entirely bipolar, right? Even Asia itself is multipolar if you think about the large and, and fast growing economies uh, in, in the region, uh, whether it's Japan, which is large but not fast growing, or India, that is large and fast growing, and, and the other economic centers. So the economic, Diplomatic, um, you know, military power is quite dispersed, even with China being kind of, you know, an 800-pound uh, gorilla, if you will. And I think that rather than focus on just the bilateral dynamic, we should actually look at the ways in which these regional or you know, we think of as peripheral or neglected countries actually do play a central role in how the dynamic unfolds. And I would just characterize it as a, as a sort of dichotomy between outside in efforts and inside out. And if inside out means China and its efforts uh, unilaterally or otherwise to try and push United States further back and away from its uh, historical uh, naval dominance and posture in the region, uh, out past the first, second island chains, and so forth, uh, then the outside in is what is the effort that the US is now leading 
with the sort of Quad Alliance, with working with India, with Japan, with Australia, and with what those four regional, uh, what those four powers can do to support the second tier countries that have these direct confrontations uh, with China, uh, like uh, the Philippines, uh, Vietnam, and Indonesia in the South China Sea. So that's the outside in. It's the outside forces and powers, the you know sort of democratic uh, allied nations working to build the capacity of the sort of interior smaller countries and collectively to shape, to channel, uh, to sort of you know, mitigate uh, Chinese uh, behavior. And I think that's the inside out versus outside in dynamic that's going on. It does still center around China, but it's an approach that really takes into account the, the complexity of Asian diplomacy, which is not really about alliances. You know, we, make, we like to make these analogies to Europe in 1914 and alliances and escalation, but I think you know, the, the Admiral uh, hopefully would, would agree that uh, you know, the US has allies, but in Asia, Asians don't think of each other as allies. And so it's a very different kind of mindset strategically in the region. It's a lot more you know, mercenary, you know, for lack of a better term, a lot more promiscuous, and a lot more just shifting of calculations that are, that are much more tactical. So you know, you're not going to have the kind of neat structures that we, that we, that we would uh, map onto this region from Western history. It's better to look at just how Fleeting these relationships are, and that makes uh, that really does put the burden on diplomacy. You know, both uh, American and obviously Asian countries themselves to to manage these dynamics better. Very good, Farah. You are um, also an author of uh, How We Win, a book on countering violent extremism, which, although it's not focused on Asia, has lessons for this region. So, just again, as a sort of start of a ten, can you kind of sketch out how your work um, looks at this region's future? Well, I think one of the things that's important, let's look at the, the title of this uh, session today. We're talking about a chessboard. Uh, you cannot play chess if you're only ob observing one or two of the pieces on that chessboard. You have to look at the entire chessboard in, in order to win. And I think many nation states, whether we're in Na Asia or around the world, tend to look at power structures and geopolitical risk based on very traditional, uh, tr traditional definitions around economy, around uh, military, around things that we can measure and we understand stand. It is important, it is actually vitally important that we look at the things, the trends, the emotional fabric uh, that is moving the globe uh, and, and that, that's a really important dynamic because if we look at Asia where uh, it has almost 800 million youth here in Asia, 45% uh, of all internet users in the world uh, exist here in Asia. Uh, young people spend six hours a day uh, in leisure time on their smartphones. Those statistics may seem like unrelated to this idea of geopolitical risk. But in fact, countries have, have a blind spot right in front of them. Uh, and that blind spot is they are not connecting the ideas that are, that are coming from those smartphones into the minds and to the emotions of young people around the world. And what I know is that uh, the kinds of extremists that I've been working on, Al-Qaeda, uh, the so-called Islamic State, certainly not the only terrorist organizations out there. We obviously see different kinds of us versus them ideology globally. But if we're calculating what we have to look at here in Asia, it would behoove all of the nation states and corporations themselves to factor in the soft, soft dimensions, the emotional dimensions around identity, around belonging, uh, around how these young people feel about themselves, because it impacts every single thing that was said on the stage already today, uh, and it will impact for generations to come how communities are able to live with each other uh, and, and defeat extremists who want to pull them apart. So when I look at the work that I did in the, in the book, How We Win, it was certainly not from a lens of one part of the world or the other. I was looking at one quarter of the world that is Muslim. I was looking at the fact that uh, a, a terrorist organization like AQ or ISIS is recruiting young Muslims. And, and to bring it home to Asia, let us remember what the population of Muslims are in this part of the world. Whether we are talking about the fact in the year 2050, India will be the largest population of Muslims anywhere in the world, living as minorities. Whether we're talking about Indonesia, whether we're talking about Pakistan or Afghanistan, or in fact, 
we're talking about Cambodia or, uh, or Thailand. The Muslim communities that exist uh, matter to the way in which we think about the trends that are taking place. So uh, I see all of this uh, as a really important call to action. Uh, and I think as we're figuring out how we, how we think about um, the region and how we think about how it connects to the world, we just need to think about the ideology of us versus them and who is absorbing it and how and why they are. Very good. And John, so I want to sort of touch a little bit more on, on what's going on in the Korean Peninsula, but, but maybe just as a start, can you tell us a little bit about what you, in a sense, building off what others have said about the US and China and what we see happening in the region, what can we learn from the current state of play with North Korea in particular about the, the way the big powers are, are behaving in this part of the world? Sure, James. I think one thing to keep in mind is that when you look at political risk, the frameworks that we're applying and how we're trying to understand some of the big events happening and establishing diagnosis, causality, or what's causing what, uh, the lens of what's happening to Korea is really helpful in looking at some of these broader issues, many of them that have already been discussed. So the main thing I want to point out is it's remarkable in a past uh, couple of days, really, the traditional peg of geopolitical risk has been oil. And if you see what happened in Saudi Arabia, uh, we don't have this dominant impact in terms of what's happening in the international markets because the shift in the focus has gone elsewhere. It has become very diffuse. And so when we look at the Korean Peninsula, it becomes a very interesting lens, almost the canary in the coal mine of globalization. So a lot of the issues, U.S.-China trade war, uh, things that are happening directly with uh, South Korea and Japan, uh, what's happening with uh, North Korea in terms of the broader international security aspects, there's a powerful lens through which we can view this. The uh, three things that I quickly highlight is that in this kind of analysis, many of the outside observations and the analyses, frankly, don't connect with reality because the framework now is directly what's happening between the leaders. In the case of the Korean Peninsula, we've gone from elevated tensions where the likelihood of military conflict in 2017 was extremely high, now to what are called love letters, right, going between Chairman Kim and President Trump. <laughs> the number and the frequency, the content of those letters, uh, I think is much more than you know, we would assume on the outside, and what the leaders are directly saying to each other gives a sense of subjectivity. And so this idea of an A-plus and what's happening in the resolution management of this crisis, on the outside of it, it's really detached from what's happening inside of that scope. We're anticipating the beginning of working level talks, but that's gonna be a long drawn out process. But right now, for that particular case on, on the security side, it's North Korea not doing intercontinental ballistic missile tests is something that the two leaders have agreed to more or less. And that has put the nuclear issue in, in the box in this idea that they'll uh, manage this issue going forward and resolution will take some time. On the aspects of trade, I, I think there's an important element when you look at South Korea, it is involved with all the major global supply chains, particularly in the technology space. So what happens with South Korea is a great indicator. Uh, the health of these supply chains, what's happening, the transformation, there's a lot of adaptation going on because of these trade issues, but South Korea becomes a very important lens for these developments as well. And then finally, on the cyber piece, uh, this is an area that we are completely underestimating. And the case of North Korea, a lot of the physical limitations of nation states don't carry over into the cyber domain. And North Korea is not an actor and, and a high impact actor overnight. There's been many, many years of development of resources, cultivation of talent, pipeline, and so forth. And now with reports of Chinese assistance in broadband development inside of North Korea as well, the days of the North Korean hackers using Chinese IP addresses and so forth, They'll continue to likely use those, but we're looking at a different type of level of uh, the playing field of what North Korea brings to the table. So those are the three key elements, I think, through the lens of Korea that can be helpful in the geopolitical risk analysis. Okay, that, that's great. Let's, since we're in Singapore, home of the first uh, Trump-Kim summit, uh, let's, let's stick with home, home rules and talk a little bit about North Korea and, and the outlook for that. So, Kurt, can I, can I turn to you? I mean, I know you took place, you, you were part of the Sixth Party Talks. You used to uh, watch Korea pretty closely. Could, could you give us your sense of what, um, what might happen in what is probably the most important Trump foreign policy initiative for the rest of his term? Well, in short, I don't know. But the, um, I think that one of the key issues to observe is whether the uh, goalposts have moved. Um, toward North Korea in a, in a direction that's more favorable to a resolution because it's closer to nor what North Korea wants. Um, I think North Korea would like to have more stable relations with its neighbors and with the United States, but
but is re you know, very reluctant, um, bordering on absolutely determined not to give up uh, its nuclear capability and some missile capabilities. And, and so how the details can work out in that situation when the U.S. may or may not, this is where the uncertainty is, be signaling that we would be looking for an arms control agreement rather than an arms elimination agreement um, is, I think, kind of the key question to look at going forward. In addition to the dynamics, is I think, I think John explained very well that the, the change in approach, uh, very much top-down approach to negotiation instead of a bottom-up um, confidence-building measures-based approach. And, and so this fits the broader pattern that you we're talking about about the change in U.S. leadership style, right? Um, and I think it's very clear that that President Trump's style is to prioritize the issues that he thinks are are very important to him, both politically and and personally, uh, or he's identified his priorities and focus on those. Sometimes to the exclusion of other priorities, uh, and that can be a problem when when uh, second tier issues, sleeper issues, uh, don't get the level of attention that they deserve. Um, but I do think that there's a, a lot more in, in technology is part of this as well. I think as the, you know, things are very different from when someone got on a ship and, and traveled three months around the world in order to deliver a letter. Um, personal diplomacy is much more um, uh, physically uh, feasible these days. John, do you want to jump in on that and give us a bit more of a sense of where you see this, this playing out because it has been one of the most important foreign policy themes of the, the last couple of years. Sure. So Kurt's being very modest. He's been working on these issues for a number of years. So he's been at the president of creation of you, many you of these. You may give me a responsibility for <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh -huh. the good or lack of outcomes. The good impact. The good impact. <laughs> uh, but I, I wanted to just kind of uh, uh, build on what Kurt's saying and put it in a broader context. When you try to analyze these events, uh, you know, my former life as an investment banker many moons ago, uh, equity research analysts, uh, they were worth their weight in, you know, his or her uh, weight in gold. But now, uh, rather than the analysis of publicly traded companies, it's almost like family offices. And that's another way to look at geopolitical risk. These countries are being run by leaders as if it were a family business. And so that methodology, I think, is an important one. Because if you use the old frameworks from traditional geopolitical risk, you miss a lot. And you give, you know, A pluses, you get the answer right but it is very much the gap between reality. And so zeroing in on the Korean piece, uh, you know, for you know, a country that uh, gives itself uh, the victory, uh, you know, this idea that they won the long march, developed a, a nuclear deterrent, is now drawing down, plans to draw on the conventional military, focus on building the economy. Uh, this is the United States after the Second World War. This is Eisenhower in the new look. Uh, nuclearize uh, the military force to do the massive drawdown, focus on building up this economy that had been really uh, drawn bare thin because of the, the long march of the, the Second World War. In many respects, that's mentality in North Korea right now. And this new plan that they laid out, the new strategic line, is focusing on the economy. Uh, so we're going to see North Korea not going through the destabilizing testing cycle as they've done in the past. There is this uh, sense inside of North Korea that they have attained this nuclear parity with the United States. Whether that's delusional or not, that becomes a big part of their policy statements. And now they're trying to get into this uh, arrangement that some analysts have called an arms control arrangement in the shorter term, but a longer term denuclearization. So it's more of the management of the North, North Korean nuclear case. But again, I go back to, you know, as Kurt alluded as well, the top-down analogy. But in many respects, when it comes to geopolitical risk, looking at political leaders as, you know, through the lens of the family offices. Jim, do you want to come in on the military dimension? Well, I do, I do just two really quick points in, in agreement with my colleagues here. Um, first of all, the ambassador is absolutely right with the uh, family office kind of uh, theory of the case here as applied to President Trump. And, and here's a cautionary note. If what he thinks he's learning by managing North Korea, he believes is then transferable to try and manage Iran, that's a very dangerous proposition. And we're here to talk about Asia, and we should. But I fear that uh, by negotiating and coming up with a reasonable solution on the Korean Peninsula, which I think we can, and I think it will be arms control, and I think the chances of Kim ultimately giving up nuclear weapons approach negative infinity. I just don't see it happening. 
But I think we can live with that. I think we can create a world where we can live with that, cut a deal, things will get better. But if President Trump thinks, okay, now I'm gonna cut a similar big beautiful deal over here with a theocracy that's different than a thugocracy. You can negotiate here in ways that you really can over here. So that's a cautionary note. Second point, and it's to, to uh, Dr. Park's excellent comments about cyber as an equalizer. It's an asymmetric capability. And frankly, it's not just cyber. We, we often think of uh, strategic military activity being a triad, right? A strategic triad for the delivery of nuclear weapons. That's inculcated in all of us who have studied this. The new strategic triad is not big bombers, ballistic missile submarines, huge ICBMs. The new triad is cyber, unmanned vehicles, and special forces. And looking at what just happened in Saudi Arabia ought to give us pause in that regard. And that will impact why a nation like North Korea, because of these asymmetries, can be very capable in a small space. You want to come in on that? I just want to ask John actually a follow up because we haven't talked enough about the South Korean perspective and all of this. We know that Russia and that China will tolerate uh, a nuclear armed North Korea and won't really make genuine efforts towards promoting uh, denuclearization. But what what is South Korea's red line? What are they willing to live with? Are they willing to, um, in their pursuit, some would call it, you know, if you're a cynic, you'll say it's Stockholm Syndrome. Uh, <laughs> if you are more generous, you'll say that President Moon deserves the Nobel Prize. Uh, so somewhere in between is. Uh, is South Korea saying, you know, they really want peace, they really want accommodation, they want some kind of, you know, formal end to the Korean War, some kind of reunification. And it seems like, correct me if I'm wrong, they are willing to pay the price of allowing North Korea to retain its arsenal, not that they can actually do anything about it without, without our support. So that's where part of the disagreement has been between Seoul and Washington. So the next one to two, three years, what's the South Korean position? So South Korea's stuck. And in many respects, if you look at the internal, external, delineation, it, it's not really seen as uh, uh, disparate, but all interconnected. And you know, all political leaders uh, in democratic systems are elected for economic promises. In the case of South Korea, there is chronic uh, economic issues that precede the uh, trade issues. And one of it is youth unemployment, you know, relatively high youth unemployment for an OECD country. Uh, and with that, if you look at President Moon and what he's trying to do with North Korea, there are large infrastructure projects. And the idea is you have to resolve uh, for the short term, the nuclear issue, but put it in a box in a process so that you get sanctions easing to move forward on these infrastructure projects. The two things to remember is that from a South Korean context, they are functionally an island nation. They want to free up a lot of capacity, and that's why North Korea is an important piece of this. But they are sensitive to North Korean concerns about political influence coming through. So if you look at the transportation infrastructure projects, they straddle the coastlines. Nothing is touched in the middle. It was an ideal plan. Uh, the idea was uh, overall that Hanoi would be the beginning of a process and eventually some movement on this inter-Korean project, but with the sudden collapse, completely unexpected. No one was expecting a breakthrough, but at least the beginning of this process. All that is stuck. Uh, and then you know, quickly on the point about uh, South Korea's diplomacy and all this, disproportionate high impact in the early days to get the diplomatic off-ramp going. But once the US and the North Korean leaders are talking directly, uh, South Korea is really on the sidelines right now. And the North Koreans are basically saying no to even humanitarian assistance coming from uh, South Korea via the UN agencies. Uh, so for the time being, until there is movement on the US-North Korea side and some easing of sanctions, uh, South Korea and all the things that they want to deploy, they're stuck. Mm. Very good. Let's, um, let's draw the conversation back up. I and mean, we haven't, I think, dealt enough with US-China, which is the, the sort of heart of so many of these conflicts. And since Parag started off by saying that we shouldn't pay as much attention to US-China, I'm going to punish him by asking right. him to give your sense of, in a sense, where does, this, where does the situation in Asia stand um, between the two great powers more than halfway through the Trump even if you want to focus only on the U.S.-China bilateral dynamic, the, the central issue, we've, we've talked about the military dynamic, but that obviously isn't the only vertical of relations. You know, uh, in, in this case, unlike in the Cold War, there, are, there is an, in, an intense sort of array of, of, uh, of agendas and bilateral relations, and obviously the economic, uh, you know, the trade war, technology war, and all of these other aspects of the competition are every bit as important to some degree. And in fact, those are the ones that are unfolding also every single day 
in real time. They're the ones that obviously affect the business community uh, more than the more slow burning kind of military uh, arms race. So I do think it's worth talking about those, just not, again, reducing it only to the military dynamic. With the trade war, you know, what you see is an acceleration of this kind of a Asian decoupling. I mean, um, ASEAN has now, Southeast Asia has replaced the United States as China's like second largest trade partner behind the European Union. So, you know, clearly there is a decoupling in terms of trade, but in other aspects of relations, in terms of, um, you know, the, the U.S. business community's agenda, it clearly doesn't tow the Trump line. Of course, you know, uh, the corporate community would like to see much tougher approach towards protecting intellectual property, but they also don't want to be shut out of the China market. Hence, you can see the schizophrenia, you know, in, in the tech community uh, about this. Then there's capital markets, which is, you know, trillions to the billions of trade, right? In a way, that the trade issue, the more you can see the kind of end state of the decoupling on trade, uh, the less significant significant that becomes in the grand scheme of things, whereas China's uh, you know, opening of, um, of debt and equity markets, that represents tr trillions of dollars of potential inflows that China is very, very eager to attract as it moves into current account deficit. And that obviously is an area of connectivity that people aren't talking nearly enough about, even though it is such a big deal. Um, so I think we have to look at that as well. Now, obviously, the administration is trying to discourage investors uh, from, from taking those steps, but that's, that's sort of pushing against gravity, you know, or against, uh, you know, river flowing, water flowing down the mountain. That's just not going to happen. Money is going to go global. Uh, you know, uh, pension asset savings are going to go into China in this regard, and that's also very similar. So you can't, you know, you, in some areas they'll be decoupling and rivalry, in other areas they're still going to continue to be uh, uh, intense and deepening relations. So I, I want to ask Farah about soft power and the sort of soft power relationship between the U.S. and China, given I know soft power is something you look at, but cards on the table. Are we going to have a trade deal? No. <laughs> Anyone <OGC>. else? <laughs> Will we have a Kurt? We're going to have a trade deal, US, US China? You really want me to go there? Um, <laughs> the, uh, maybe. Jim? Another, another let, me, let, me, okay. let, me, let me elaborate. <laughs> um, China is, uh, I think, willing to give the president a trade deal um, similar to the one that they offered already. And that, that gives the president a bit of a Hobbesian choice whether he takes that in order to, to, in the election context, be able to say that all of this activity, tariffs, was accomplished something. Or does he not take it and worry that it'll be criticized as insufficient uh, with respect to the amount of leverage that he brought to bear? The outcome wasn't that big. Um, it's it's going to be a difficult choice. And I think uh, the 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 country with the agency in a trade negotiation is always the one that's on defense. And that's China. Uh, the, the person that's got to make the tough decision is going to be the president. We'll see which way it goes. So Jim? you got a you got a no. You got a maybe. I'm going to be a yes. Okay. So great. so we can totally so we've got total make this use really for you as a <laughs> But I you know my sense is is short term gain, long term pain here in this relationship, and I think that. Between now and the election, this is the Hobbesian choice. I think the president will go with uh, cutting some kind of a deal because for him, it's all about reelection in 2020. And I think he'll make the calculus that'll be better than running against China, which is the other end of it. Um, but I, I also agree, hard to say, I'd say two in three chance. I'll close by saying we're in a trade skirmish, not a trade war. Um, if we get into a trade war, skirmishes often lead to wars, and trade wars often lead to war wars. And I'll, I'll simply point out the last time we really did this was about 100 years ago, global trade war, Hawley Smoot tariffs in the United States, built big trade barriers. How'd that work out? Well, we cracked the global economy, and you can drop a plumb line to the rise of fascism in Europe, and oh, by the way, how did we get in a war in the Pacific with Japan? Trade issues, raw materials, East Asian co-prosperity sphere. So we are playing with fire on this one. Maybe that's why I'm hopeful that we will get a trade agreement. OK, no, maybe yes. So we got that one sorted. Um, Farah, <laughs> that was hard power on Best US. Best panel ever. <laughs> that was hard power on US-China. Can you tell us a little bit about soft power on, on US-China and how you perceive 
uh, that element of the geopolitical contest between the two big powers. There's no contest. Are you kidding me? The United States has reduced the amount of money that we've spent on any kind of soft power, period. Um, our embassies don't have the kind of personnel we used to have that are out there engaging, thinking about ways to build uh, capacity. Uh, culture is not something we talk about. I talked earlier about the emotional space. Uh, the cultural space, I mean, everybody's eyes are glazing over. Like, what is that? Why, why, do we, why does it matter? China's not thinking about that. They're, they're understanding the power of culture. They're understanding how important it is to increase the relationships with communities in whatever way that they can. Um, they have outpaced us. Uh, the United States is not, is not in a position right now. We, we have no strategy. Forget about the resources we're putting in there. We have no strategy in what we're doing, not just in Asia, but in any other part of the world. So when I look at a US-China relationship in terms of um, the immediate, the immediate chi China will outpace us on the, on the soft power piece, but on the long term, too. Um, I may not like some of the decisions that they have made on how they think about their minorities, how they understand their own influence uh, across the region, but I can absolutely tell you they have a plan, and they, they know what they're doing with the numbers, the gigantic of n numbers of, of young people and how they want them to think, how they want them to act, how they want them to um, impact the future years. So if you, if you are assessing uh, where, where we are in this, they're, they're outpacing us. But I want to say one other thing. Um, the issue of minorities uh, is part of soft power, too, and in, in, in it, it, there are easy wins for the US to do. There are many things the United States could have said and could have done in a more aggressive way around what is taking shape across Asia with regard to how countries think about their minorities. Um, looking here at countries in South Asia, and looking here at countries in Southeast East Asia as well, and in Central Asia. Um, and the US in this administration has not uh, done what other administrations have done, and that is to come out forcefully uh, in terms of, in terms of uh, what we stand for and what we believe. Um, there's another dimension with another player that is here in Asia, too, that is using soft power to their advantage uh, and is actually influencing the way generations think about themselves. I don't want to only speak about Muslim youth, because there are many more different uh, dimensions of this youth dynamic. But I, I do want to bring in the issue of Saudi Arabia uh, here. Um Jim brought it up Iran, so I'm going to throw in Saudi Arabia for a moment. Um, they have had and deployed themselves in this part of the world uh, under the radar of uh, almost every nation here uh, in this part of the world, uh, whether I'm talking about Indonesia, uh, whether I'm talking about Thailand, whether I'm talking about um, Cambodia. The impact of the way in which they are influencing, and this is soft power too, how they're influencing young Muslims in terms of how those young Muslims are thinking about them themselves should scare every single one of you. Uh, they are promoting a monolithic version of Islam, and this part of the world, to their advantage, has a diverse expression of Islam in so many different ways. The more you move into a monolithic version, the more you have a problem vis-a-vis um, -vis the, the kind of ideology I was talking about earlier. So when I think about this, and, and, I, and I know you were asking about China, uh, but I will tell you that even Chinese Muslims uh, are, are being impacted by the way in which Saudi Arabia has uh, expressed what Islam must be and how they must think about themselves. So your, your point about China's efforts in this area is well taken, and I want to in a minute ask Parag about Belt and Road, which is something that, that he writes about a lot. But Kurt, could I, I know that you're, you have another panel on Hong Kong, but I feel like we have to mention this at, at some point. Um, so either from a, a kind of perceptions point of view or simply your read of how this complicates the US-China relationship. Could you just tell us a little bit about your perception of what's going on in Hong Kong at the moment, given you were there so recently? Sure. The, but let me just make one comment on, on the soft power question. That I think that the United States, and it relates to Hong Kong, that the United States and the West, broadly defined, has a very compelling soft power um, attractiveness that is primarily in the private sector, it's primarily in the cultural sphere, education, and the like. Um, China has, has invested heavily in official soft power, sort of government-run soft power, to a greater extent than the US uh, or, or, other, or other countries. And that is, the risk of them doing that is that it ends up becoming sharp power yeah. rather than soft power and, and, and can backfire depending upon how it's deployed. 
Uh, but I'd also think that, that Far is absolutely right that the, that the U.S. and other countries um, in this region that are, that are more uh, liberal in terms of their principles could do a much better job of leveraging their existing soft power and translating it into, into compelling ideas about how societies should be organized. Mm -hmm. That relates to Hong Kong because the, the, the fundamental situation, I think, in Hong Kong, everyone knows about the one country, two systems framework, the promise made to Hong Kong that it could continue to be a different kind of society than the rest of China, even as it is part of China. Um, that the confidence in that construct has eroded over the last several years, uh, which is the main source of the anxiety that's being expressed by the Hong Kong public. And, and reestablishing that sense of confidence in the future of, of the city and its ability to be a different kind of society, despite being part of China, is the, is the key to, to putting things back on, on course for the city. I saw you were quoted in a piece in Nick Asian Review yesterday saying you thought that the current situation in Hong Kong risks becoming a new normal. Is that, in a, in a sense, was that an accurate reflection of what you think? Well, I did say that, and, and, the, and I think that, and, but I did say that that's not a, I didn't mean to decisively say that's definitely the way things will be. But if, if, if the, um, Beijing writ large and, and the establishment and the Hong Kong government don't take some additional steps towards accommodating the anxiety and, and lack of confidence and fear that the, that the Hong Kong population has about the situation, then I do think that, the, that this um, level of concern among the public will continue to find expression in ways that, that aren't good for the city. And so, the 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 um, as much as the government would like to say it's the it's the it's the protest movement that needs to stop, I think that the, there needs to be uh, some steps taken to to kind of bring people back on board. So let's talk a little bit about Chinese and American leadership. So Parag, Belt and Road, in a sense, was China's big bet for winning friends and influencing people in the region, particularly here in Southeast and in Central Asia. Um, what's your perception of how that has kind of changed the geopolitical chessboard? It has quite substantially. I mean, it's really, there was, there was a decades-long deficit, market failure, you could say, in infrastructure finance, despite the efforts of multilaterals, of Japan, and so forth. So China really came in with, you know, what you would call it a kind of uh, infrastructure bazooka, um, you know, uh, aimed across the region, and it's been very effective. There's independent economic analysis done by American organizations and, you know, research institutions and investment banks that have shown how the intensification of transportation and other linkages has been beneficial for the emerging and frontier uh, economies of the region that China has, has really accelerated. On the other hand, in terms of the diplomatic uh, output uh, or, or outcome or consequences, it obviously hasn't been positive, which is why you've had this um, kind of shift from or evolution from Belt and Road 1.0, which is viewed as largely kind of unidirectional and even hegemonic and debt trap diplomacy, even though that's not entirely accurate in, in some cases, towards this much more accommodating, mutually beneficial, win-win. You know, uh, China takes a bit of a haircut on some of the debt, renegotiates, uh, you know, lowers the cost of, of capital, you know, doesn't impose these non-concessional interest rates, hires more local workers. This accommodation process has been unfolding in quite, in quite a few countries, even where China you know, doesn't have to make those concessions, right? But it's doing it because it wants to see the, the broad buy-in continue. But, so what, what you'll see is that Belt and Road will sustain itself, right? It, it is, it's definitely a train that's left the station. Well, quite literally, it's many trains that have left <laughs> many stations at this point. Um, and again, by and large, from an economic standpoint, that's proving to be a good thing, right? You're seeing the, the, the multiplier effect of infrastructure in these economies. You're seeing trade grow. And, and it's, of course, very important for China to offset the impact of the trade war, because actually, China's trade with BRI countries has been growing even as obviously it's uh, you know, being uh, caught in this uh, trade war with the United States. It's even accommodating those countries by uh, seeing its surplus come down uh, in trade uh, with those countries. But politically, the suspicion runs very high. So this is the thing about you know, China may have a plan for how to go about winning friends and influence people. It may build Confucius Institutes everywhere. But let's face it, you know, in the history of this last 10 years is written, it will be the time at which China lost trust, right? When absolutely no country in the world that I'm aware of uh, has any trust in China. And it's probably going to be that way forever. Uh, so people are 
Countries, you know, realize that if China can provide certain low-cost infrastructure services and capital for to help them with their own development objectives, you know, they'll participate in that. But no one's really going to trust uh, China beyond those uh, transactions, and that's going to be, I think, again, we'll look back and we can already see the story today as to how China managed to do such a good thing that that the five billion people of Asia need and gain very little thanks in the process. I think Americans, actually, we can sympathize with that. <laughs> we think about uh, you know, the kind of looking at the legacies of the Cold War efforts and how little gratitude there is for everything the US did in many parts of the world today. So that's Chinese leadership in the region. Um, John, can I ask you a question about US leadership? In particular, you mentioned the current uh, spat, mini trade war, full trade war between Japan and South Korea. Many people see this as an example of fading U.S. leadership in the region, that this was something 10 years ago that the U.S. would have stepped in and sorted out. I mean, you, you said the Korean Peninsula is often the canary in the coal mine. Can you say a little bit more about what you see as the outlook for that particular um, sort of example of the changing geopolitical balance in the region? Sure. So we talk about this bipolar world in the sense of security and economics. And South Korea, in many respects, has been straddling those two spheres for a while now. Uh, its economic future has been with China for many years. Uh, it eclipsed U.S. Uh, US South Korea trade many, I think, over a decade ago. And so when you look at that relationship, the South Korea-U.S. security relationship is the primary guarantor for South Korea's security. But with a lot of the retrenchment going on in the United States, and this is something that has been going on for a while but accelerating in the current Trump administration, uh, there, there's many ways to read, I think, what South Korea is experiencing. So you know, the, the twin takeaways, first is that from a South Korean perspective, a lot of these type of historical issues in the past, they felt the United States played a very discreet but very influential role behind the scenes to prevent South Korea and Japan going this route of full-blown escalation. Uh, the second thing, though, is with increasing US demands of South Korea for more in terms of burden sharing for hosting US troops in South Korea, there's this existential question of what use is the US-South Korea alliance in the broader South Korean discourse. And that's a tough question to answer. And so this is where uh, looking at how South Korea is dealing with a lot of these issues can be one way to analyze how the US alliance relationships with other countries may be going. The outlier in this is Japan, because if you look at the direction arrow Japan wants to go in, you know, the title of our, our panel here is uh, Avoiding Checkmate. But if, if it were framed as crisis, you know, there's a saying in international relations, don't let a good crisis go to waste. And if there's a view that US leadership is withdrawing, there's a natural opportunity for uh, Japan and its definition of self-defense to become larger and greater cooperation on the naval front, especially with the larger concept of Indo-Pacific. And so uh, there are a number of areas where there are pluses and minuses, but overall how we see the view of the U.S. alliance structure, that's a part where rather than this overall coordinated game plan uh, where it's all nicely laid out and implemented, surely with some hiccups, we're going in different directions in how these various countries see the alliance structures. Jim, do you want to come in on this? I mean, I suppose the obvious question is, as a retired but longtime US military leader, how worried are you about the health of the US alliance system in this part of the world? My sense is it will uh, continue to be relatively strong. Um, we've got an administration that um, doesn't like big multilateral trade deals, doesn't really like big multilateral alliances, famously kind of leaning back from NATO, for example. But in this region, I, I think the fundamental US connections to the major players militarily are, are quite strong. They're quite embedded professionally. The, these are militaries that have operated together historically. We, we share common systems, common command and control networks. That's not to say they can't sort of fall away, but um, taking Japan and South Korea as an example is a very good one. Um, from a military perspective, we continue to work very well with the South Korean military. We work very well with the Japanese military. Our problem is trying to get them to come together. Australia, New Zealand, very strong. US-Singapore relations, very, very strong. I'll close because I wouldn't want us to wrap the panel without mentioning Taiwan. And I think that to the Hong Kong point, um, part of the restraint, part of the speed break on China is they know the Taiwanese are watching. They know that this will be an important sense of whether Taiwan gracefully over time becomes part of China or whether it's going to be 
a more uh, dramatic process. Let's hope not the latter. Uh, but militarily, I think we're going to continue to support with uh, systems, military systems, Taiwan. Um, that's going to be part of this South China Sea flashpoint. We, we need to remember Taiwan guards those northern approaches. It's extremely important real estate. It's an alliance piece that um, I think is, is pretty important for us. Do you want to come in on that as another you know, very recently retired U.S. diplomat? Well, I, 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 I would second um, the Admiral's observation that the situation in Hong Kong has implications for how Taiwan views um, its cultural, economic, and political relations with the mainland, with, with China. And I think that China is aware of that and, the, and would not want to try and push Taiwan farther away uh, because then that creates a, a, um, more difficult choices for China in the future. So, so um, again, it points back in the direction of, of more dialogue and figuring out solutions to, to, to political um, dilemmas rather than, than dramatic action. Now we have a big flashing light here which says 10 minute warning. I want to turn it out to the audience in just one minute, but I want to give a final word to Farah, which in a sense, I mean all of the panel here are counselors and advisors to companies and businesses. They try and work out how to grapple with this new era, but maybe I'll ask you rather than everybody, uh, what advice would you give to to investors, to companies who are trying to puzzle through a new era in which geopolitical risk is clearly going to play a much greater role in business decisions than it has over recent decades? Well, we've had a really great conversation about the things that everybody puts on their list of um, factors to think about as they look at this region. And I hope, uh, and I, I try to poke at this, because I think the things that are uncommon, the things that you don't expect that you need to do, you do need to do. Um, I've talked about the demographic shifts. I've talked about the use of technology and how millennials and young people are thinking differently. Your companies need to understand that. You also need to understand that 52% of young people in this part of the world look at companies and say that they, excuse me, 72%, look at, the, at companies and say they actually think very carefully about what your company stands for. And this idea of corporate purpose is not something that should be um, dismissed. It is a really critical component, whether you're talking about ESG or you're talking about the, and those kinds of movements. What is going to happen in the future matters to this generation. And your, uh, your assets, how you think about stability in this part of the world will require you to think about what you're doing in a community and how the people that live in those communities feel. So all this gushy stuff that you don't necessarily think about and your risk uh, analysts on your teams may not want to think about, I urge you to think about that stuff because it really does matter. Yeah, I wonder if there's anyone from Cathay Pacific in the audience. Um, <laughs> so uh, I think we have some roving mics around here. So sorry you have a roving mic. I see a hand here. I'm going to take a round of three questions. It's very difficult to see you because the lights are blinding. Please introduce yourself and please keep it very short and a question mark at the end, please. Okay, absolutely. My name is Nishit Desai, I'm an international lawyer from India. Uh, my question is on soft power. Has it moved from the state to the, uh, what is called social media? And what is the new role of social media in creating new awareness about the things? Because state has always been a controlling authority and the whole concept of nation state is, you know, we are questioning that as new millennium, including myself. Very good. Who else would like to ask a question? Otherwise, I'll go back. If there's no one far, do you want to take this one? Just briefly, let's remember that soft power is not just what government wields and what businesses wield in the traditional sense. What's happening in an offline and online space matters. Soft power is influence. Soft power is how you affect and, and move somebody, to attract somebody in a particular direction. Uh, we didn't talk enough about technology today. Um, I don't need to tell you how important it is for us to think about uh, what's happening. You said you're from India. Yeah, um, if anybody was to get a prize on fake news, uh, India would receive the global award for it. Um, and uh, and it, it is really important. 
I mean, that we think about how that impacts society. So influence, influence matters, real facts versus fake facts. Um, how you get people to, to buy into things uh, will matter. But I will argue to you that soft power hasn't jumped from the offline space to the online space. It is a momentous change that's happened that we've brought in uh, technology the way we have. But there is a dynamic here that requires us to think about the on and offline together. Right. I can't stress to you how bright these lights are. So if you want to ask a question, you really do have to go like this. There's a hand right at the back. Again, introduce yourself, please. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Eric Bethel with the World Bank. Uh, having recently read uh, Graham Allison's book, uh, Destined uh, for War, uh, it, I, I, and, in the, and in that context, I wanted to ask perhaps all of you the same question, which is the relationship between the US and China is going to be the single most defining relationship, at least in most of our professional careers. But let's, let's take a short-term view. And the short-term view is, where are we two to three years from now? Are we in a, a, a protracted Cold War? Are we in a kinetic war? Or do we have a trade balance? I mean, where, where are we? Very good. Thanks, Eric. Does anyone else? Oh, I see any other hands. One question here at the front. Yes, let's again introduce yourself. Yeah, uh, so I'm Helen Hua. I'm from uh, Shanghai, China. Uh, I do have a question, but I want to talk to Dara first, because you brought the issue about uh, impact on youth, and you brought the issue about soft power. Uh, so um, there are millions of youth in China. I want to share a story that I recently met my mom. Very brief story, Quick. please. <laughs> yeah. Uh, she sent her son to U.S. for high school uh, education, and the son is born in China, is a Chinese citizen. Uh, back a few years ago, uh, her son would have pursued a university in the U.S., very naturally. Um, but sh he just graduated, and he decided to go to Canada instead because the uh, mom and son are very worried about uh, pursuing computer science in the U.S. Um, so my question is to everybody here is, you also have a lot of youth in China, and they also six, spend six hours on yes. Internet. What are the message the world from outside in trying to say to Chinese use? OK, so we've got uh, three minutes left. So what I'm going to do is let there are two questions there. And I'm going to sort of let everyone pick at whichever one they want for a, for a kind of final word. Um, Kurt and Jim, I, I presume you should um, talk at least about the way you see US-China in I'm actually going to years. touch on both, because the, I think they're interconnected. The, the, the fact that you asked a, a question or made a statement about how um, domestic political cultural trends in the United States impact perceptions in China is exactly a demonstration to Eric's question that this relationship between the U.S. and China and or between China and the Western society broadly defined is much more complex and, and, uh, and deep and interconnected than anything that Graham Allison even remotely touches in his rather provocative book. So I think that, that, that the uh, really wondering whether we're in a Cold War or not is not the right way to think about things, but rather how do we manage a relationship where there, uh, and it's not just the US and China, but China as an outlier in, in the global system that, that is not going to change that quickly, but, but, and there's going to be a lot of friction points. And how do we manage that? How do we deal with that? Uh, and, and, and find a constructive path forward that, that, that results in, in, in you know, good social trends and economic growth and all, all that good stuff for everybody. I would say we are going to have uh, short term some gains, perhaps surprisingly. I think we are going to figure out how to negotiate through the trade piece. I think intellectual property is going to be harder. But as China begins to generate more and more super high-end intellectual property, I think there'll be a leavening effect of the frustration with that. I think cyber is going to be a major kind of shadowy battlefield. I think the real problem as you get into the 10, 20-year future, having had that short-term gain, I think the danger is South China Sea territorial ambition pressures inside China because of dwindling demographics, um, all of that can lead a nation to lash out in other ways. So around mid-century, I think, is probably the highest uh, point of concern. Because I think ultimately, 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 in the 100, 200-year future, I think both nations have a shared interest in a global system that works. 
Neither is trying to change the politics of the other, particularly. We're not geographically contiguous with arguments about specific borders. I think the chances are okay. My son-in-law is Chinese American. His parents emigrated to the United States. That rising Asian community in the US will be some small bit of help. I'm gonna close by saying 400 years from now when a historian sits down to write the history of the 21st century, it'll be less about the rise of China, more about the rise of India because of demographics, because it's a democracy, because it has the Indian Ocean in front of it. I think that's the one to bet on as the century unspools at the far end. There we go. Welcome to the Indian century. We're going to go a couple of minutes over to give everyone a chance for a final word. John? Sure. So the namesake of my institution, John F. Kennedy, said in 1962 uh, that we enjoy the comfort of our opinion without the discomfort of thought. And I think that is something that's very, very common right now. In that same speech in 1962, he also said that the great enemy of truth weren't the lies, but these myths that were persistent and persuasive. So in many respects, I think we're dealing with this competitive and this very rapidly growing, very productive uh, area of generating these myths. The anecdote to this is diagnosis and trying to understand why these factors are happening. Uh, and the tying into what's happening in the US, Japan, US, China uh, space, I should say, uh, in many respects, I think when you see the uh, shock of the US-China trade component of it, it is having a huge impact, as many in the room know, on global supply chains. And so this is a piece, I think, uh, going forward to look at. Uh, that's, I think, where in many respects the big story is. And understanding the adaptation, the evolution, because of this big shock, uh, is going to have profound impacts in, in a number of different areas. Uh, so with that, just keep in mind this notion of the importance of diagnosis and the need to focus on that more and more. Farah? I would say a couple of things on, on the youth piece, uh, and that is this. Um, we are looking at power, uh, and traditionally have looked at power as power over, as opposed to power with. The generation of millennials and Generation Z see power with. So for Chinese youth and other youth around the world, their networks and how they connect to each other, that's the power. They see power differently. So I would want us to take that into account, first of all. The second is, um, I'm going to use the word diversity, as soft and comfortable as that may be and squishy, and you may think I've lost my mind, but the power of diversity in this part of the world is critical. And, the, and we cannot allow us to get, um, get to a place where the us versus them is, is overtaking um, the traditions and the history of this really important part of the world. Uh, and I think we need to honor that. Uh, when we're seeing the fierce rise of hate around the world, it is not immune to this part of the world at all. So I would say that kind of resilience that we have to build is critical. And as we look at China and Chinese youth, um, that plays a part in it as well. Very final thought, Prague. I mean, I, I tend to discount or I don't like Cold War analogies to the US-China relationship because in terms of the bilateral relations, it is so different from the Cold War. But the one way in which there are similarities is that the proxy competition matters as much as the bilateral dynamic. And again, in the spirit of our first round of questioning about the importance of other Asian countries and Eurasian countries, we should focus on that in the next few years. About you know 12 or so years ago, I started making a list of all the countries that Washington had labeled a rogue state, you know, a state of concern. It was Syria, Iran, Iraq, North Korea, Cuba, Venezuela, and so forth. And then I made a list on the same, you know, a column, what are all the countries that China is providing financial, diplomatic, military, other kinds of lifelines to? And guess what? It was the same list. And that was a dozen years ago. That was before it was widely acknowledged that China is a global uh, superpower such as it is today. So again, those proxy countries, those third countries, that's where the real action is going to play out in the next few years. And that's why not only, again, as a response to Belt and Road, what you're seeing is that Europe, uh, the US, Japan, India, and others are all throwing their hat in the ring in terms of this competitive marketplace of infrastructure finance, what I call an infrastructure arms race that really goes in parallel to the arms race, arms race uh, that the Admiral was talking about. So watch that space. You know, look at the look at Iran, where the US and China where China and Iran have just mapped out a 25-year strategy, for example. You know, that's really going to be where you'll see the, the real competition play out. Very good. We've gone two minutes over. Thank you for your patience. We've hopped around a bit like knights on the geopolitical chessboard, but with these Kasparovs and Magnus Carlsons of uh, geopolitical <laughs> analysis, we're a little closer to the end game. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.